Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets and the holy scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, let's read it together. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let's do this in Spanish. A todos los que estáis en Roma, amados de Dios, llamados a ser santos, gracia y paz a vosotros de Dios nuestro Padre y del Señor Jesucristo. Somebody was showing off with their professionalism in their Spanish. Amen. Y'all, y'all are supposed to slow it down for us. Amen. Y'all. You always pronouncing them always like Santo in them. <laughs> Y'all were pronouncing that too well. Y'all was my llamados a ser santos. I hear you. I hear you. Amen. Um, clap our hands to the Lord for the, His Word. And I'm hearing a lot of people's Spanish progress. People, people won't know what to do with you because. Uh, you used to just say hola, and now you got uh, KJV Spanish. You're like llamados. They're like, huh? Like, yes, yeah, see, sí, santos, Espíritu Santo. Recibe el Espíritu Santo, e ora. You're like, huh? All your, all your Spanish is church language now. You can't even have a normal conversation. They're like, how are you doing? Recibe el Espíritu Santo ahora en tu vida. You're like, I just said, how you're doing? <laughs> Amen. But I'm so thankful for the word. Amen. God is so good. Romans chapter 1, verse 1 through 7, beautiful. Let's get into it. Let's start this. I want to speak on this first session of Romans 1. Uh, ver chapter 1, verse 1 through 7, I want to teach on this subject, first impressions, first impressions. Let's just pray that God bless this series. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your people. I thank you for the hunger. I thank you for the anointing. God, you're able to do something in your word. It's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. God, bless your people. God, they've come with a hunger. They've come with a desire to learn of you and to know you. God, do something special in our church today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Clap your hands as you're being seated. First impressions. There is something powerful and uh, deep about going through the scriptures verse by verse to understand the historical cultural background of the writings, to understand the background of the author, and then to understand how it applies uh, to our lives personally. How can we live out uh, these scriptures? How can we live out his word. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Rome, uh, but this is a unique writing because Paul had never visited Rome at this time. The only time he would finally visit Rome would be a time where uh, he would eventually um, die in Rome. Uh, because of the cause of Jesus Christ much later, years later. Uh, but it is projected that he was writing to the church in Rome in A.D. 57. And while he's in Corinth, 
possibly uh, dwelling uh, with Chloe, uh, Chloe uh, in Corinth. And he's writing because the church in Rome is growing at a profound rate. And with that growth, there was tensions uh, that were building among uh, the people. He's writing to the church in Rome. Rome, we understand Rome. We still talk about Rome. Rome and its, and its, and its greatness, Rome and what it's done, the Roman Empire stretching out hundreds of thousands of miles. The influence of Rome was just, is just un, was unbelievable and is still unbelievable to this day because much of America uh, is founded upon the principles uh, that were in the Roman Empire. The beginnings of Western civilization, it started in Greece and it was uh, further enhanced by Rome. Greece was more concerned about philosophy. The Romans were more concerned about common law. And so there's still a lot of our common laws that originate out of the Roman society and the Roman Empire. And so for Paul to write to Rome, he's really writing uh, with the whole world in mind uh, because Rome was stretching across so vast. To speak to Rome is to speak to hundreds of different cultures uh, because Rome had stretched out so vast uh, that there were many different nations that dwelt uh, in the Roman Empire. Now Rome is reduced to, to just a small city uh, in Italy, but at its height, it, it stretched out hundreds of thousands of miles. Now, he's writing to Rome because there are believers in Rome. Uh, they are arguing about how these believers got there, but many believe because of, in Acts 2, people were coming from uh, all around the world to celebrate Pentecost, uh, they believe many came from Rome to Jerusalem to celebrate uh, Pentecost. And so they went back to Rome and the church, the house churches started. And as the house churches started in Rome, it was started originally mostly primarily Jewish, a Jewish church. But hear me. But then there came some laws where they were pushing the Jewish people out. They were exiling the Jews from Rome. And so the Roman church became primarily Gentile, uh, which is anyone that's not a Jew. It became primarily Gentile. But then over the years, listen, the Jews started trickling back in the Jewish Christians. And so now the Jewish Christians were coming back in to find it a primarily Gentile church. So what happens? What's the setting? The setting is, is that there were a lot of... There was a lot of conflict that was happening in the Roman church because there were tensions between the Jews and the Gentiles. There were tensions and there was a superiority complex because they're battling over who's more important and and, and who is more important to the body and who, who, who did Jesus love the most. And, 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 and as this tension between the Jews and the Gentiles in the Roman church. And so Paul understood that the faith of these people were spreading apart across everywhere. He wanted to give them who they are and who their identity is apart from their background, but their identity being in Christ. And there's something about your identity being in Christ that, that divides, that divides you from the world. It doesn't divide you in the church, but it divides you from the world. There's something about being in Christ that, that separates you from the things of the world. As I preached this past Sunday uh, about love and how love has to be greater than, than everything. There's something about your identity being in Jesus Christ that doesn't allow you to get caught up in the winds of hate and the winds of warfare and the winds of things going on in the world. But your identity in Christ reigns supreme above everything. This is what Paul is 
is presenting. He is presenting the Jew and the Gentile to find their identity, not in just their traditions or how they were raised, but to find their identity in Jesus Christ and in them both coming to that common ground in Jesus, it will eliminate any form of division. Because both of them had things to learn and to grow in by coming in that commonplace, Jesus Christ. And so this is what he is presenting in the, throughout the book of Romans. He is presenting to them a more superior way uh, than the way that they were raised. And that as we talked, I, I've said it, it's been actually years since I've uh, said it to our church has been since the beginning of 2022 since I've said it in our church but we've talked about how whenever you're building a church of a kingdom community where Christ is the center and Christ is the head uh, what happens is when you're building a kingdom community uh, a guy named Sherwood Lingenfelter he said it this way when you're building a kingdom community what happens is is that people start getting the habits and the mindset of kingdom community. But then when crisis hits, listen, when crisis hits, he said people begin to revert back to their default culture. And he said when they revert back to their default culture, that it starts causing problems in the church or in the leadership team uh, because they are protecting their default culture more than conforming to the biblical culture. And so he said that everyone's on this journey to be conformed, but when crisis hits, people revert back to how they were raised. They revert back to the culture, their, their cultural, what they call it, cultural mores. They revert back to that because they find their safety in their culture instead of their safety in Christ. And have you ever noticed that it's like someone with, that, that plays football, uh, that it, they're a quarterback, and they used to throw like this. And they're saying it's not effective. So they do hundreds of hours like this. And so they start throwing the ball like this, hundreds of hours, hundreds of days. But then they see that 400-pound lineman about to light them up. That 400-pound lineman is about to tackle them. And so what does he do? Watch this. To get the ball out faster, he reverts back to his default culture. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's what happens with Christians. We say, we say pastor's preaching, love, love, love. So you're like, love, love, love. Then somebody curses you out and you're like, eh? You revert back to that old man, right? Like the, the, the one that you thought was buried. Come on, somebody. But that old man says, I, don't, I didn't like that. And you know how you used to do it. How did I used to do it, old man? You used, to, you used to fight him back. But pastor's teaching us, you know, to walk in love and everything. Man, what pastor talking about? <laughs> And so here's what's encouraging about that is that in Christ, by his spirit, there is the ability to walk in a unity of the spirit and, and that, that also expands his kingdom, but it has to be something from an identity in Christ, not something in our own self-motivation or our own self-will because we don't have that power in us. It only comes by his spirit. And I told them Monday night, listen, anybody can have a spirit of unity. Sport teams can have a spirit of unity. But there's only, only the church can have a unity of the spirit. Only the church can come in the unity of the spirit. Anybody can have a spirit of unity, but only the church can have a unity of the spirit. That's when we're all walking together in the same cause of Jesus Christ, in the same cause, in the same mission, in the same love and heartbeat 
for the world. Amen. And so he is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to the church in Rome. Now, these are saints in Rome. That is important to understand because th this is not where you get your introduction uh, to the gospel. Th these are saints that he's speaking to who have already obeyed the gospel that he is teaching them about the treasures that are in the gospel and how to live out these treasures that are in in the gospel. That's what the epistles are all about. If you want to know how the early church started, you have to go to the book of Acts. You go to the book of Acts, it teaches you how it started and what they did. They believed, they repented, they confessed, they were baptized in Jesus' name, they were filled with the Spirit, they were walking in holiness, they were planting churches. That is the, the ideal thing, but if you want to know how to live out that experience in Acts, that's why you go to the epistles, you go to the writings, because all of the epistles were written to churches, and it's teaching them on how how to live out this experience because Paul doesn't just want you speaking in tongues and just being jumping all around but not knowing how to live it out in your home how to live it out in your occupation how to live it out and how you treat one another that is priority Paul, these epistles are to teach the church they got the spirit but they got to know how to move in it it's like having a car that, that goes 180 miles per hour. Now, that is powerful. That is a gift. But you cannot drive like that through a school zone. See, see you got it, and it's powerful, but you got to know how to handle it. Got to know how to handle that engine. Come on, somebody. You got to know how to handle that Holy Ghost engine. You can't just be running over everybody. Come on. The cashier's like, oh, I'm going through it. Lift up your hands right now. Hey! It's like, no, no, you, know, you got to know how to handle it. Come on, somebody. You got to be like, you're going through it? Well, well, let's talk about it. You know, the word of God says that, and, and, and you, you save your hey, yeah, amen, for the right moment. Come on, are you getting what I'm saying? You can't be on 180 uh, miles per hour in the Holy Ghost all the time. You can't make friends that way. That, that's going to that's gonna hurt you. Relationships, it's, it's going to hurt. Come on, somebody. I'm, I'm preaching right now. I'm, I'm preaching right now. Uh, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt. Your kids won't even want to share no troubles with you. Like, hey, mom, I, I made a C. You come over here. Hey, 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 hey. Just talk to me, mom. Amen. Just give me some encouragement. Amen. So, so, so what, I, what am I saying? They have this amazing thing from God. They've received the spirit, Jesus Christ on the inside, yet, yet they are struggling with how to thrive in community. And it's community that shows us how much God you got. Man, it got quiet. Okay, all right, here we go. You, you never know the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. You never know if you're long-suffering if you're in a corner by yourself all the time. Oh, my God, I'm by myself. I'm a long-suffering person, aren't I? I have the fruit of the Spirit called patience. This is awesome. No. Community will show if you have the fruit of long-suffering or not. When someone says, hey, hey, what's going on? Hey, 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 can you hear me? Hey, hey. Mama! Daddy, 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 daddy. <laughs> Community will test your fruit. Does this make sense? So Paul is trying to teach them 
with what these unsearchable riches that have come from God, what do I do with that? Right? Because some people put that in two separate boxes, right? They put their unsearchable riches box and then they put their life box. So I speak in tongues, I pray in the Holy Ghost, I pray for people in the altar, but I ain't talking to nobody after church. Somebody smile. I just need somebody to smile. I'm just, just smile for a second. Amen. You can smile in any language. <laughs> Amen. Where it's not enough. I'm making people nervous, huh? <laughs> People are like, are, are we sure we wanted to start Romans 1? <laughs> Can we go back to next level principles? That was awesome. Watch this, guys. Christianity is not just this out there abstract thing. I'll, I'll show you why. I'll show you this is a falsehood that is just Christianity is just this heavenly world of, of prayer and, and fasting, and it's just you and God where it doesn't affect your daily life on how you treat your community and treat others around you. And people have been hung up on, it's like, well, church is just, I, I, I pray in the Holy Ghost, I pray for people, then I go home, I don't expect any change in my life, I don't expect any change in what I do in my community or on my job or anything, and they do that. And let me tell you, that's why the world is the way it is right now. I'm going to tell you why the world is where it is right now. It's because the church has come woefully short of its mission. Every community, the, a community is supposed to reflect, the church is supposed to be reflected in its community. So if our community is, is, is all suffering when we talk about concepts like revival, everyone talks about revival. Revival isn't revival unless it impacts community. So we have to have such a walk that what we do in here starts spilling out into the streets. The hope, the peace, the joy that we have here, we become representatives of that joy out into a broken world. And what happens, we start changing our community. Because now people walk in and enjoy, why? Well, man, there was somebody from Bible Center of Orlando. They gave me an encouraging word. There was somebody from Bible Center of Orlando. They prayed for me in the, in the coffee shop. There was somebody from Bible Center of Orlando. They prayed for me on the job. There was somebody from Bible Center. Of, and all of a sudden, what's happening in our church is now being reflected in the community. And the community starts taking notice and watch this, this God that we serve is real because this isn't just an event or a moment, but this is something that's being lived out in the day to day. We're not just living for God at church, we're living for God everywhere we go. That's what integrity is. Integrity is the state of being one or the state of being whole, meaning who we are right now, that's who we are at home, at work, with kids, with family, with spouse. Come on, somebody. So Paul sets the tone here because he's trying to get the Gentiles off of their background and he's trying to get the Jews off of their background and he sets a powerful tone in his epistle. Every epistle starts with a salutation. It starts with a greeting. So here's his greeting in the first scripture. And this is why we had to do seven verses because his greeting in his first scripture is just, is just profound. Look what he says here. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. We can end our series on Romans with that one scripture. Because he is encapsulating the heart of what it means to be in Christ. Noticeably, two things that he says that are very unique. He says, servant and apostle in the same text. 
My goodness. And the same verse, he mentions that he is a servant and he's an apostle. See, the world tries to teach you that you have to choose. Is that powerful? Paul said, I'm a servant and I'm an apostle. But if you look at the word servant, you have to look at it in the Koine Greek. Because servant doesn't reflect what he's trying to communicate. The Greek word is doulos, which literally is slave. Now, there's a difference between a slave and a servant. Servants get hired. Slaves are owned. Servants can quit. Slaves can't quit. So he says, so so KJV, because of the sensitivity to that word slave, you know, the English translations, they try to be more sensitive and put servant. But Paul's not trying to be sensitive here. He's trying to be accurate. And accurately, he says, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. I, my, I have been bought with the price. My life is not my own. I don't get to do what I want. Is that not against, like, today's Christianity? So, again, here he, here he says, he says, listen... I am a slave of Jesus Christ. I don't have any rights. He says, I'm a a citizen of Rome, but I don't have any rights. I'm owned by Jesus Christ. And, And to be a slave in this day, it meant that you were totally dependent upon your Lord. It meant that you were in complete submission to your Lord. It meant that your will, my goodness, was replaced by your Lord's will. Where you didn't have a will. Where my will is to do whatever my Lord wants. You see the tone that Paul is setting? He's setting a tone to say, that when we are in Christ, we are to be his bond servants. We are to be, we are to be, we are to willfully, that's the paradox of, paradox of Christianity, to willfully be a slave to Jesus. That doesn't sound fun, does it? Everybody getting tense as I'm talking about that. Everybody getting tense when, as I'm talking about that. But it's to be a slave To Jesus Christ, that whatever he says goes, and you don't even argue. Could you imagine a slave arguing back with his master? Hey, go clean that. Man, forget you. (laughs) There will be some, what do you call it, penalties. Are you getting what I'm saying? That that, that you can't be Christ-like. Without being willing to humble yourself as Christ did. If there's anybody that could say no, it's Jesus. But the Bible says that he humbled himself in the form, here it is, of a ser- servant, doulas, a slave. The king became a slave for you. And so who are we to be like, nah, man, you know where I'm from? We don't, we don't do all that bowing down stuff. Jesus is like, well, I did that for you. And if I didn't do it, you wouldn't be here. Somebody just clap. Somebody just clap. It's getting tense. It's getting tense. The doulas, the the. He humbled himself in the form of a slave. And and Paul writes that to the church in Philippi 
about Jesus Christ's example of humbling himself in the form of a slave. And he does that at the beginning of his his letter to the church in Philippi, why would he do that? He's doing that to set a tone because in the church in Philippi, there were racial tensions between the Jews and the Gentiles. They had trouble giving, getting along. So he had to bring them into Christ's standard to show him what he did and that we ought to have the mind that was in him that we also should have the mind of Christ because when you have the mind of Christ, there's going to be a unity and there's going to be a preferring of another before you. Western culture says, I will step on you to get where I want. I will beat you to get where I want. I will lie on you to get where I want. Christian culture, kingdom culture, it says, I prefer you. No, I want to use you. No, I think they do a better job. Yeah. Two times... Years ago, they tried to, uh, uh, you know, appoint me into uh, two national uh, positions, uh, making about six figures salary. And they were astounded when I told them, no, I think they would do a better job. I'm good. I'm, I'm not called to that. I think this person would do a greater job. I'm going to, I, I want to, I think you should vote for them. They were looking at me like, yeah, yeah, it's amazing how obeying the Bible is like a foreign concept. And then my name came up. Out of millions of people, my name came up to get this position, and within two seconds, I, I withdrew my name. Hi, I'm Victor Jackson. I withdraw my name. I'm voting for them. Because it's the concept of preferring another. Why would I prefer another? Here's why. Because I regard the body of Christ with such a caution, circumspect, sensitivity that I understood that if I accept this position, listen, here's, here's how kingdom it is. If I accept this position, I am getting in someone else's place, which hurts the body. And if I'm out of place, who's going to take my place now that I'm going out of that place? You're hearing what I'm saying. So, there is a fullness, what Paul is showing us here, that there is a fullness that comes in Jesus Christ that does not come with any position, any power, any money, or any fame. There is a fullness that comes just by being in Christ. That that is the chief aim, that that is the chief pursuit, that is the heart desire to be in Christ. And for us to think that that's something less, it means that we don't really have a full and total revelation of what it means to be in Christ. Do you understand that you are seated in heavenly places that when you are in Christ, that you have authority to tread on serpents and scorpions when you are in Christ, that no demon can stand against you when you are in Christ, that no weapon formed against you can prosper when you are in Christ, that you are walking in victory when you are in Christ and for you to think being in Christ is some lesser version or some bottom bar you don't understand what you are a part of today I'm telling you the best thing that you can do in your life is to be in Christ the best way to walk is to walk in the ways of Christ he says 
I, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm, an, I'm Paul. You know who I am. You've heard my name. I've never been to Rome, but before, you've heard of my miracles. You've heard of all the great things that I've done. You've heard, you've heard about, about, about something biting me, and, I, and I'm shaking it off in the fire. You're hearing about what I am accomplishing in the earth. But he said, if you want to see my premier role, my premier role is that I am a slave of Jesus Christ. I will not be brought under the power of any weapons of the world but if you want to know something about me I'm not doing this out of Paul's come on power I'm doing this out of the power of Jesus Christ and everything that I do that's good it's not coming from inside of me but it's coming from something inside of him says I'm, I'm only here because of my master's will and every accomplishment that I've done comes out of my master's will, not mine. Whew. Then look what he says. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. Now he shows that he's an apostle. Apostle, the Greek word is apostolo, which literally means to be sent out by the sender that you're sending out is directly connected to who sent you. That I am commissioned by someone and I am only doing what they're telling me to do. Even to be an apostle is some measure of accountability. Is that powerful? That I'm not just going plant churches and doing all this on my own volition, but I'm, I got to go back to the cinder. And those two things can exist is the duality of a ministry, that you can be a slave to Jesus Christ and, and be an apostle. You could be a slave to Jesus Christ and still have a power that you operate in that, that people may admire, but you know that the, your intricate nature is the doulos. It is a slave to his will. To, I, I've talked about this a lot where, you know, humility is not a destination. Humility is an attitude. What does that mean? That means that you can have a billion dollars and still be humble. But how many people think when you have a lot of money or you have a lot of influence or you have a lot of popularity or you have a lot of this or a lot of that, the first thing you think is, hey, I'm praying that you be humble. Stay humble, brother, right? Because we have made humility a destination. They say humble beginnings, right? But humility is not a beginning. Humility is an attitude that no matter how much you have or how much you don't have, you're walking in humility. That's what they said. They said the same person that parks his, his nice car in front of the church entrance and the person that parks his car at the back of the church because it doesn't look good, they both have pride. Pride isn't because of how much you have. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's an attitude. So you got to stop looking at people like, oh, yeah, I bet they prideful with all that stuff. No, you don't know their heart. You don't know their mind. You don't know who they are and what they are. They could be humble with millions of dollars. It's not a destination. It's an attitude. And you could be broke and be prideful. Come on, somebody. You can be bro It's not a destination. It's an attitude. Why does it have to be an attitude? Here's why. It's because the scripture states, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he shall exalt you. Say, 
So if I'm humbling myself under the Lord and he exalts me, what happens if I say, no, if I get exalted, that's pride. No, I can't be exalted. That's pride. I got to stay. I got to stay down here. No, if you refuse your exaltation, that's pride. Are you getting what I'm saying? See, it's an attitude because your humility, your false humility becomes pride. When you say, no, I'm going to stay down here because I don't want anybody to look at me funny. Humility is while you're being exalted by God, you're still walking in the same humility because you know where your help comes from. So you see Paul saying, I'm a, I'm a slave and I'm an apostle. I can work miracles and I can get on my knees and serve you. Well, that's a powerful ministry. That's powerful. That's powerful when you can be used by God and, and still be humble enough to, to, to care for somebody homeless or to care for somebody hurting or to care for somebody, for somebody broken. That is, that is beautiful. And I messed, I messed a lot of people up, you know, earlier uh, a few months ago when we had the children's service, the night before, I preached to about ten to 15,000 people. Then this was this summer. This was in June. I preached to ten to 15,000 people, then got on an early flight back to Orlando, and I dressed up as rowdy. I dressed up as an adventurer for the children's service. Rowdy and Chad. What's going on, kids? That was straight from over 150 miracles happening. 150 people came on the platform at this convention and they testified one by one that the Lord had healed them. It was a, it was a powerful move of God. And I went from that to come in as dressed up as rowdy. Had a, had a, had a giraffe on my hand. Y'all not hearing me out there. But because that, my friend, that is just as powerful as preaching to 10 to 15,000 people. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, why is that powerful? Because my power isn't predicated on my destination or my performance. My power is that I'm in Christ. And as long as I'm in Christ, I can come and talk to the kids. Come on, somebody. As long as I'm in Christ, I can come and preach to thousands and preach to hundreds and preach to five and preach to two and teach a Bible study at Starbucks to one person and be just as fulfilled speaking to one person as it is speaking to to thousands. This is countercultural. But Paul said, I'm a slave to Jesus Christ and I'm an apostle. What is he doing? He's already setting a tone. This is the first impression. He's setting a tone that I am not trying to get superiority over anybody. The head, the, the source has to be Christ. That's how all of us are going to get along. And we see he goes, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now, he's, he's giving of the consecration, that he's different than anybody else in the world. He's different than the Roman customs. He's different than anything happening in the world, that he has been separated unto the gospel of God. What is he getting them ready? This is the first impressions. He's getting them ready to start walking a journey that is beyond where they come from or where they are. He's saying, you're different. That's what this word separated means. It just means to be, you're different. That's what later when we talk about being saints, you're different. 
This is what verse 1 through 7 is pushing. This is what Paul is pushing in the first impression. Number one, I'm separated unto the gospel of God. Number two, Jesus Christ came in the spirit of holiness. That's separate. Number three, you're, you are called of Jesus Christ. That is the ecclesia. You're coming out. Number, number four, here it is. You are the beloved of God. You're different. Number five, you are saints of God. You are different. This is what he's trying to put into the church at the time. Do not go with the trends and the patterns of the world. You are different. You have to walk different. You have to talk different. You have to live different. You have to treat people different. You are different. Ah, you're different. You're different. You're, you're, you're different. This is what he's called. He's challenging them to come up a little higher, to not bow down to the systems of the world that are trying to control their thought, are trying to, to make them hate. I, I'm a Jew. Hate. I'm a Gentile. And hate. And this. No, he says, no. Look up a little bit. Set your affections on the things which are above. But put your head up. You're citizens of a heavenly kingdom. You're citizens of another country. You are bigger than this. You are different. So look what he does here. Oh my goodness. He presents to them that he is the doulos, a slave, and he presents to them that he is an apostle. Now remember, there were 12 apostles. Judas by transgression fell. In Acts 1, they they cast lots, and then they put another apostle, Matthias. There were 12 apostles. Now, Paul is like the 13th apostle. But Paul, you, you got it. This guy says he's a slave of Jesus Christ, and then he starts saying, listen, I'm an apostle just like these other apostles. Because the same way they saw him, yeah, they saw him, they got to handle him and everything, but I got a vision on Damascus Road. My, I, I, I didn't see my goodness. I didn't touch him with my physical hands. But what I felt in the spirit was just as real as what they felt in reality. My Lord have mercy. I, I, I'm trying to tell you, we don't have to be these apostles in the Old Testament that have to have to touch Jesus with our physical hands. The evidence that he walked on the earth is that I have his spirit resting on the inside of me and this is real. The evidence is when I call on his name, something happens when I call on his name. When I need healing, I just say his name and he comes down and he heals me. When I need peace, I just say his name and he comes down and gives me peace. That's the evidence that I know him. Come on, somebody. My goodness. He said, I'm an apostle. I've been separated unto the gospel of God. Look what he does here in verse 2, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Look at him trying to create a, a cultivate unity here. He says, listen, I'm separated unto the gospel of God. That's for you Gentiles. See, the gospel is for everybody. You're included. And then he goes to verse 2 and says, listen, which was prophesied, which was told what, that would come by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Look what Paul is doing. He says, listen, y'all keep challenging one another for who's better. What I'm saying is y'all both got it. My word. He says, listen, you got it, Gentiles, by the gospel. And you Jews, you got, you got Jesus understanding the Holy Scriptures. Both of y'all experiences are needed. That's what he would say later. He said, you Jews, you do those things that are contained in the law. And he said, you Gentiles you do those things which are contained in the law without having the law my are you getting what i'm saying he's bringing them to a common ground in jesus christ and jesus christ is the common ground yes everybody has preferences everybody has backgrounds everybody has ways that they were raised but we've got to come to the bottom line and the bottom line is we've got jesus no matter how you got him you got the same jesus that i got you may have been raised in church for 40 years 
years. Come on. But the same Jesus you got uh, is the same Jesus when someone walks through the double doors for the first day uh, and it's their first time coming into the house of God and they lift up their hands and call on the name of Jesus. Uh, and when they get touched by the hands of the master, Jesus Christ, uh, they got the same Jesus that you got. Uh, yes, they only got him a day and you got him 40 years, but it's the same. It's the same Jesus. Whether you were raised in church or whether this is your first day in church, when you get Jesus, you get the same Jesus. You don't get an inferior version of Jesus. You don't get a diluted version of Jesus. Come on, somebody. You may have came from drugs, but once you get Jesus, you got all that you need. You may have came from prostitution, but once you get Jesus, you got all that you need. You may come of being raised on a church pew for 60 years and 80 years, but the same Jesus that your mama got, that's who you God. The same Jesus that your daddy got, that's who you got. The same Jesus that your great grandparents got, that's who you got. Come on somebody. And nobody is less because of how much experience or how least experience. What do we have in common? We have Jesus in common. And that is the common ground that can change a broken world. Can you clap your hands to the Lord right now? Like that's the common ground. Jesus. 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 That's the common ground. And it's, it's a powerful thing. Here it is. So he connects them that they're both needed and both valuable. That Jesus came to save both. He didn't just come to save the Gentiles. He came to save the Jews. He didn't just come to save the Jews. He came to save the Gentiles. He didn't just, he, he, he came to save the world. No matter how they got to the, you see, those Gentiles, they were eating meat with blood and eating pigs. And when they got saved, they got saved the same way that the Jews got saved while they were living kosher. Are you kidding what I'm saying? Both of them needed Jesus. Is that powerful? Both of them. No matter how much they obeyed the law, they still needed Jesus because through the law they had knowledge of sin. They needed Jesus. No matter how much they tried to obey it, they fell short. They needed Jesus. No matter how structured or strict your life was or is, you need Jesus. No matter how great your discipline is or is not, you need Jesus. Verse 3. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, we're getting into some theology here. He starts talking about the incarnation and how Jesus came through the lineage of King David. Now, watch what it says here. He begins to say that he was de declared to be the son of God with power, According to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now listen, he's focusing on the life of Jesus Christ. And it's through his life that the Gentiles and the Jews have hope. Now watch this. Notice in verse 4, he does not say that he was declared to be God the Son. You will not find the words God the Son in your Bible. You'll only see Son of God. Because anytime you hear the word son of God or son of man, it is referring to his messianic identity or what he is doing in the flesh. On what he is doing in his earthly body. That the son of God 
was made manifest when it was born of the Virgin Mary. But there wasn't an eternal son just, you know, sitting up in, in the heavens making decisions with the father. I, I'm, I'm keeping it biblical here. But there was a moment where the son was manifested. The son of God. Referring to him coming through the line and the lineage of King David. That's important. Because everything was coming to a moment. And the son, God manifested himself in the flesh. Philip said, Philip said, show us the Father. Philip said, so Jesus, show us the Father and it will satisfy us. Show it. You keep talking about the Father. Show us the Father. It will satisfy us. And Jesus said, have I been so long time with you, Philip, and have you not known me? That's what he said. He says, the Father dwells in me, and he does the works. Okay. John gets into this. We have a hand if this is helping. We have a hand if this is helping. This is, we're, 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 going, we're going deep here today, but y'all are ready. Y'all are ready for this. John says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is the logos, the plan, the thought, reason. And the beginning was the thought, the thought was with God, and the thought was God. Then in verse 14 it says, and the thought, the Word, the thought was made flesh and dwelt among us. So before time began, God had a thought of, a, of him becoming a Messiah to save man from their sins. But the thought wasn't made manifest until he came in the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary had the Son of God. It was always the plan, but the plan wasn't inaugurated or more biblically correct, is incarnated until Mary had Jesus. Does this make sense? According to the spirit of holiness. Now, again, we see different. Everyone say different. By the resurrection of the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ? Now Paul is saying, listen, you see that I'm a slave. You see that I'm, uh, that I'm an apostle, that I'm doing my master's will. He's saying, this is not just me. I'm setting an example for you. I am expecting you guys to do the same thing. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep up verse 7 because I want to help you here. I, I love the word. Now, we know that there's only one God, right? If anybody has any questions about anything that uh, I've taught or anything about one God or anything of like that, your pastor is open to questions. I would love to answer your questions. Amen? And so... Keep verse 7 up there. I'm excited. Okay, I'm about to run. Amen. No, really, I'm about to run. I really am. Y'all waiting on me to run, aren't you? Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to run. Amen. I'm not gonna. <laughs> now, there's one God. God manifested himself in the flesh. When you receive... The Holy Ghost is known as the Spirit of Christ, is known as the Comforter. God has manifested himself in three premier ways. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it's all 
one God who manifests himself in these manifestations. It's not three people, it's one God. Three people would be something called triism, which is, was very common, polytheism, to believe in three gods. It was very common in the world. Every major religion, the majority of major religions have three gods at their forefront. Um, I was about to name the, uh, the Hindu uh, gods. It's primarily three. I believe it's Brahma, Shiva, and I can't think of the other one. I don't know if it's Krishna. I can't remember the third one. But all of them have, but they have millions of gods, but those are, those, those are the premier three. When Moses introduces the concept of one God, it's foreign. Nobody ever heard of the concept of one God. Not only one God, but a God that you can't see. There's only three religions in the world that believe in one God. It's Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So Christianity is founded on the premise that there's only one God and his name is Jesus. Now, in order for Christianity to survive in Rome, okay, okay, I'm going to, okay, here we go. In order, this is like a, this is the introduction, okay? We, we, I got to, I'm catching you up. All right, we're going to, amen. So l- let me get this to you. In order for Christianity to survive in Rome, they could not introduce a second God. I'm going to tell you why. Because the Romans forbid any new religions. They forbid any new religions. Any new religion that came on the scene, they immediately stamped it out. They had no room for any new religion. The only reason they allowed the Jews to worship Yahweh is because when they conquered Greece, they allowed the Jews to continue worshiping their God, and so they allowed the Jews to keep worshiping Yahweh because the the Romans were infatuated with anything that was old. You see today how we're all infatuated with something new? The Romans were infatuated with things that were old. So any new religion that came, new God, they immediately stamped it out. So the only way for Christianity to survive in Rome, I'm about to help you right here, and under Roman oppression, was Yahweh had to be their God. So when the beginning of Christianity in Acts, it was tough to discern who was in Judaism and who was in Christianity because they both claimed Yahweh as their God. Oh my goodness. And they said, we believe in Yahweh as well. We just believe he was made flesh in Jesus Christ. And that's the only reason it was allowed. But if they would have came and said, Yahweh is not God, only Jesus is God, Rome would have stamped it out. But they were allowed because it was considered to be an offshoot of Judaism. Somebody clap right now. Does this make, does this make sense? I'm getting deep here today. So it's because they believed in one God. They believed that Yahweh was made flesh in Jesus Christ. That the one God of the Old Testament became flesh in Jesus Christ. That's why they called it the way. That's why it was, it was different. It was different yet the same. They, they, had, they, they didn't cast aside the Old Testament. They, they felt Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. That he is just Yahweh, our Savior, which is what the name Jesus means. Yahweh has become our salvation. 
And that's the, if they would have presented him as a second God, you wouldn't have ever heard of Christianity again. But because they introduced him as the one God of the Old Testament, there was nothing Rome could do. Somebody clap your hands. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. Now, thank you for keeping verse 7 up there. Watch this, guys. Why is this important? Because if we know that there's one God, and if we know that the apostles preach one God, and we know that, um, that the prophets preach one God, then why in verse 7 does it say, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, when you go verse by verse, you're able to tackle difficult questions. And what did I always say? What is, my, what is one of my quotes? Truth is not afraid to be investigated. Okay. So why does he say here, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? It seems like there's two here. And it seems like that in English until you get to the Koine Greek. Because any time you see the word and, everyone say and, it's a Greek word chi. Kappa, alpha, iota, chi. Any time you see the word chi, it's the word and. It's really the most used word in the New Testament. So you guys know a lot of Greek in your New Testament. You got the Greek word chi and. It's about, I, I forgot what percentage it was, but it's a good percentage. It's like 8% of the New Testament. So y'all know 8% Greek in the New Testament. Come on, Greek scholars. Come on. Come on, somebody. Watch this, guys. Watch this. This word and, the Greek word is chi, and anytime you see the word chi or and, it is translated as and, even, also, or namely. Context determines meaning. Everyone say context. Context determines meaning. So when you see grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, you can see that and means and, also, even, or namely. Everyone say namely. So let's read it in that context. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, also the Lord Jesus Christ, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Namely, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where, when you have questions in Scripture, you want to read a text within the entire context of the Bible. So Paul is saying, God our Father, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. God our Father, even the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not two separate and distinct persons. It is one God. Everybody say one God. So the first impressions are is that, and it makes it easy for there to be one God because at least it's someone that you can follow. Imagine if you had to follow three people. Think, think about that. You need to be like all three of them. Like, okay. Well, I don't want to be like the father. Wasn't he killing people in the Old Testament? Did, didn't he like destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? 
Oh, I like the father. He, he's destructive. Come on, somebody. Imagine that. I, 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 who am I going to be like today? Hmm. Mini, 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 mo, catch me. I'm going to be the spirit. I'm going to be like the spirit today. Ah, spiritual. doesn't ask you to be like the spirit. doesn't ask you to be like the father. It asks you to be like Christ. Because the father manifested himself in the flesh in Christ. And God purchased the church with his own blood in Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, there's only one God and his name is Jesus Christ. Can you clap your hands to the Lord? Everybody stand and clap your hands. My goodness. Just clap your hands and stand, everybody. First impressions. This is our introductory into Romans. Next week we're gonna we're gonna talk about um uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to talk about the gospel and how Paul is a debtor to the Greeks and the barbarians. For him to write this is just unbelievable. And we're going to talk about how we owe a debt to the, to the world to give them the gospel. And so that's where we get our application. But in this first lesson, what we have to understand is that Paul sets the standard very high by saying, I'm a doulos, a slave of Jesus Christ. And while everybody's fighting to say, I'm superior, I'm superior, he's like, listen, you know what I'm fighting for? I'm fighting to show you I'm a slave. And it, it's countercultural. Anytime, anytime you see strife or like competition, especially in spiritual things, it's always a work of the flesh. It's always a work of the flesh, and the works of the flesh will not edify God's kingdom. Amen? And so, and so the standard, this is what I want you to take away, the standard that you need to walk with is walking as, as a, a slave separated unto, <laughs> look, a slave separated to be a saint. A saint means to be separated. It means to be called, called, called out and called unto Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what being a saint is. And so what we need to understand and what we need to operate in is we need to operate in that we are distinct, that we are different from the world, and our lives have to, have to, have to reflect, be reflected with his image and with his touch and with his anointing, and that we are to be different where there's going to be, by this shall they know you're my disciples, that you have love for one another. That's one of the greatest distinctive elements of being a Christian, our love for one another. Can you clap your hands one more time to the Lord? Let's lift up our hands, Lord Jesus. Uh, we want to go through your word verse by verse. God, in this introductory lesson, let us understand that we are called to be different, just like the church in Rome was, that we are called to live separate, just like the church in Rome was, that we are called, Lord, to be saints, that we are called, oh, Lord, to give your gospel uh, to the world, that we are called to be different in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, in the name of the Lord Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, open the windows of heaven on us. Let us walk in the love of God. Let us walk under the influence of the spirit and not the influence of the culture, the influence of the spirit and not the influence of, of any of our experiences from the past. But God, help us to walk in the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you clap your hands to the Lord?